For those who are politically wise, a show about the lives of Christians in Ohio involved with politics. Introducing your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Greetings, my fellow patriots, saints, and sinners. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. At the end of the show, there will be a blessing. Don't miss it. But first, a word from our sponsor. Next time you're thinking about beating the train, think again. It takes a typical freight train traveling 50 miles an hour, one and a half miles to stop. That's nearly 18 football fields. Don't try to beat the train. Ohio's roads can be highways or dieways. The choice is yours. A message from Operation Lifesaver and this station. The opinions and statements on this show belong to those who give them. The rest of the show belongs to Thomas Wise Words, all rights reserved. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Called Politically Wise, I am interviewing Senator Bill Beagle in his office in the Ohio State House, in this over on the Senate side. Bill, tell my listeners about yourself. Well, thank you for having me, uh, Reverend Wise. You know, uh, my name is Bill Beagle. I've uh, been in the Senate for about two and a half years, and I represent uh, Miami County and Preble County, uh, a large portion of Montgomery County in the city of Dayton and the southern part of Dark County, which is about 350,000 people. And uh, prior to being in the Senate, I was on the Tip City Council uh, for six over six years, including served as city council president. And prior to that, I was on the Tip City Planning Board and very active in community affairs in Tip City on various boards and commissions, uh, and including the Tip City Library Board and uh, various other uh, community functions. Professionally, I worked for a major bank in town for many years, uh, running branches and making loans and running departments and doing financial analysis. And uh, left the workforce in 1999 to become a stay-at-home dad, and I started buying apartments. And today I have um, 60 apartments that, uh, that I run, most of them in Miami County. And so I try to provide you know, secure, safe, affordable housing for people uh, while at the same time serving as a state senator. So you're, you're a stay-at-home dad, so you must have... You know, you have a wife and kids. And that, that, that's correct. I'm glad you uh, – I sometimes stumble at the biography piece and forget major portions of it. That was funny when I went on. But, yes, I've been married to my wife, Karen, for 26 years and have three children. One is at uh, Miami University. Uh, the other two are in Tippecanoe High School. One is a senior. I've got a son who's a senior and uh, a daughter who's a freshman. So it was a, it was a revelation this year as I, as I took my youngest kid to, uh, uh, to high school, and now all my kids are in high school or older, and I'm – I'm feeling older myself, so it's one of those moments where you feel old when your when your youngest child is now in high school. So, kind of scary. Yes, it's it is it is, and so as soon though you'll be having an empty nest. And, and what did your wife work? And- My wife owns uh, Dare Electronics in Troy, Ohio, and uh, it is a company that her dad started in the 1970s, and she now has ownership of it and has been running it for a fair number of years now. So it's a manufacturing company. So she's. Uh, uh, a wonderful woman, a great mother, and a wonderful leader, and is um, you know very successful in a in a field that is dominated by men, you know, in manufacturing. So to be a woman owner and um, and running the company very successfully is uh, is a good role model for our daughters and, and for others as well. And she's a huge help to me and um, and has been very supportive. And it, have your family, any of your children, gone uh, going into politics? You think? I don't know that they'll go into politics, but they're politically aware, which I think is a, a, a benefit, really. I mm-hmm. mean, when we think about young people, and some are very engaged, and many are not. And so to raise children who, if nothing else, will value public service and are raised with the idea that the community they enjoy doesn't just happen, uh, whether it was teaching catechism or the, uh, the Saturday children's mass that I did uh, in my church, I mean, from the very beginnings, they knew that, you know, mom and dad are busy. They're going to be gone for a while while they go do something for somebody else. And um, and although that has taken a political turn and they are interested in politics and the voting process um, and they understand that votes matter and so on, uh, it'd be interesting to see if any of them actually um, embrace politics as a living because they see, they, they see the tough side of it as well as the 
I don't know if there's a glamorous side, but they, you know, they, they see the, both the good and the bad. It's, it's one thing to, it's fun to meet the governor, and it's something else to, um, to have people protesting you in your own town, which I've been through as well. Really? That happened, huh? Yeah, we, um, I, I joined the Senate in January of 2011, and in my third committee meeting ever in my life, they rolled out uh, Senate Bill 5, the, uh, the public union reform bill, and created a... Um, it was just a big firestorm here in Columbus, and so um, I had to be escorted to committee meetings because it was in my insurance committee that I was on. So, uh, so I had to actually be escorted to a committee meeting or two. The bill sponsor had to have a bodyguard. Um, we had people banging on our door um, and protesting uh, throughout the state house. But then at some point, yes, we we received a call that um, that there were going to be protesters in the city of Tip City. And my wife and I had to arrange to have our children, since I was in Columbus and she was going to be at work, uh, we had to arrange to have our children picked up at school because we didn't know if they were going to be outside our house and our kids were coming home to an empty house or, or where they were going to be. So it was a, a frightening moment um, for our children. And so we had, you know, Grandma and Grandpa went, went and got them and, and kept hold of them. And they ended up, they were in, in downtown Tip City. They weren't at our house. But... And we will be right back after the break. To some people, they're just a pet, a dog or a cat. But to you, they're part of your family. They've shared your lives, provided companionship, and given unconditional love. And just like when a human family member passes on, you want your four-legged family members to be treated with dignity. Baker Hazel and Snyder Funeral Home and Crematory has been caring for families since 1941 and now offers the same level of service for your pets at Snyder Pet Crematory. Call 274-1151. 274-1151. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. It was an unnerving experience, so... How did they weather that? Um... Children are very resilient, and I think they they learn some things from it. Uh, I think that they were they were fearful. I mean, we we live in a you know Tip City is a community where fear isn't something a lot of people um, experience day in and day out. Um, certainly, as I as I took this job, I didn't think I would ever be fearful for my family um, or for my physical person. That isn't something I expected. I knew that you would get um, a lot of you know, intellectual confrontation, um, verbal confrontation in committee meetings and in town halls and that type of stuff you expect. Um, but to be worried a little bit physically about whether uh, something could happen to you was, was unexpected. I think they've, they've come through it, uh, very well. And they, you know, you just learn something from it. You know, there's ways to do things and affect change and there's ways that really aren't very effective. So did you have protesters at your home? No, no, but I did the not. Threat. Just a threat. They were they were about a mile or two up the road. A mile or two up the road. Yeah, really? up on Main Street in Tip City. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So. Some from out of state. Some from in state. You know, it was it was all part of the part of the process. So it was a big learning experience for me, and that was you know, it's a very big learning experience for me on, on how how the political process works here in the in the state house and um, and how many of the bills and many things that we do here they have, since you're affecting an entire state there's always somebody who's impacted by what you're doing so it may make that known and typically that means they're going to come to my office and see me or they're going to write me letters or send me emails they're not you know carrying signs and, and, and horns and, and all that stuff um, whereas in a city council they're uh, most city councils rile up their, their citizens maybe once or twice a year. Maybe there's a rezoning issue or a tax issue that brings people out. And typically, city councils are fairly quiet um, um, boards to be on. They're handling important tasks, but the citizens are watching them on cable TV. They're following them in the newspaper, and, and that's really about it. And in the state house, it's a, it's a vast difference. There's so much um, that we impact a lot of people that they're always, there's always somebody impacted, and they're always going to come talk to us about it. But usually in ones and twosies, not hundreds. Well, onesies, twosies, and in, in a very professional manner, they make their case, and um, and and I think people understand that there's, you know, that there's disagreements. People come from different points of view, and a lot of what we do is um, you're 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 learning, you're making decisions, and people respect those decisions. It's it's about being honest and forthright, and say, you know what, I, I can't support you on this. Um, you know, I support you over here. I can't support this provision. Um, I can't support you at all. And there's ways you can do that and, and be perfectly civil. 
Yes. And we get a lot. We get a lot of that. Oh, a lot, a lot. Yeah, a lot of civility, and you know that's not the stuff you read about in the newspapers because it's not very exciting to read about. No. It's when people start yelling at each other and, and throwing things at each other. That's that's what is more exciting to hear about, but it's fairly infrequent. Very, very rare. It's mm-hmm. something's really gone wrong, right? Majorly, mm-hmm. if that happens, if someone raises a voice, raises their voice either you know, on the floor or in in, in a meeting because mm-hmm. that something's really failed. And so, uh, most of the time, I I find it very, you know, and and after the cameras are off, everybody's mm-hmm. cordial to each other, sure. and, and I appreciate right. that. I mean, that shows statesmanship. I think. I think so too, and I. I I'm not the biggest uh, sports guy around, but I think there's a lot of comparisons with, with sports and that people will go out and battle uh, where they have to battle. And it's out on the field, and they put on their, their helmets and their body armor, and they, um, they, will, they will tussle. They will fight with friends to, for dominance on a field, and then, and then when it's over, it's over. And, and I think there's, there's, um, there is a lot of that. And again, it's not something you see a, a lot of, but it's there. You know, from what I understand from some folks, maybe it's not as uh, the relationships aren't as rich as they used to be, uh, with with uh, the effect of, of term limits and, and turnover in the general assembly. As a member, I don't have, you know, I may not know uh, folks on the other side of the aisle as as well as they used to 20 years ago when there weren't term limits. Um, but uh, but still, there's a lot of good personal relationships, even though you you come from different points of views, and you can respect those points of views, but. So you argue at certain times, and then uh, and then you're right. You can ask about their children and how the, how the kids are doing, and uh, and they know your kids' names, and you know their names, and and you have that relationship outside the um, <laughs> you know the the arena, which the is arena. our Senate floor. Yes. Yeah. So the show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Do you pray for a politician? Do you think a politician can be a Christian? Do you think a politician should stand up for Christian principles? Do you think politicians should pray together? Do you want to see more Christians in politics? If you said yes to any of these questions, please join the Ohio Prayer Caucus Network. Find the Ohio Prayer Caucus Network on Facebook. Welcome back to Politically Wise. If you want to email me, you may do so at politically.wise at gmail.com. Please like us on our Facebook page, Politically Wise. Tell us about your faith. Mm-hmm. Tell you how you grew up and all that. Well, I uh, I was uh, born and raised Catholic, still Catholic, and you know, son of an altar boy, and and a family of altar boys, and so, uh, and as I mentioned, I've participated in, in my church by by teaching catechism for a fair number of years. And, uh, and doing the Saturday Mass, or excuse me, the, um, the kids' Mass at Saturday, uh, through a variety of other functions, uh, have helped and volunteered throughout the church, as, as has my family. And, you know, the, 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 the faith community we have is, is of vital importance to me. You know, these are the people who knew me before I was a senator and, um, and who were welcoming and accepting of me before I was a senator, and they're the people who are going to tell me exactly what they think. Um, and... With whom I share a bond that that goes beyond, um, you know, business relationships, and and things like that. And I draw upon my faith constantly while I'm out here uh, doing my job as a senator, and for that matter, as as a landlord. You know, a lot of compassion needs to, you know, that that job as a property owner. You try and provide safe housing at a reasonable price. You're working with people who can't pay their rent and, and showing compassion that way. And then likewise. In the Senate, it, it, is, it is, you know, how do you deal with people who are um, not so polite with you? And those, those exceptions who, who, who treat you poorly, treat your staff poorly. Um, and, you know, how do you do God's work uh, within all the whereases and, 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 you know, the 90-page bills that we're doing, the 200-page bills doing and, and all that? And how do we keep... Um, keep our faith in mind as we go about the, the tedious work of government and how do we take care of the poor and how do we show compassion um, while executing our responsibilities uh, in government to, to, to be responsible, to spend money wisely and do all those, those competing um, challenges. And, it's, and so it's something I live every day. I'm always touched when I'm out in the district. And whether it's going through a company or you're in a fair or a picnic of some sort, and people mention that they're praying for you. 
or I'll pray for you. And it never fails to, to touch me because that's that's really what I ask for. Despite the, the fundraising and all the other things we have to ask people for, to ask for prayers is something that uh, always means a lot to me. I'm a prayerful person. And uh, to know that people are praying for me, um, for, for me and my family to endure the trials that we're enduring and to make the best decisions we can just is really all I can ask for, and it means a lot to me. And so how do you keep your head straight in all this cloud mm-hmm. of, sure. of voices? Well, the easiest, the easiest way for me to keep my head straight is to, um, you, there's a number of, of ways to keep your feet on the ground. Um, you attend church, which is helpful. Uh, it reminds you of the, the, the big picture of why we're all here, right? The other thing we do, I do, is you keep in touch with the district and the, pe- the real people in your district. Because when you're in Columbus and you're dealing with professionals who are arguing you know, for things and against things, and there's a place for them, they are professionals and, and, and they have their place, it, it, you know, I'm there representing those 350,000 people and about half of them didn't vote for me, right? So, um, so we, but you represent them anyway. And you recognize that that's your mission and that's your job. And so you, you, you go amongst the people and you're always reminded then in talking to real people, whether I'm a business owner or an employee or someone who's looking for work, and it gives you a sense for what common people and real people are thinking. And that's really what we're supposed to be taking back to the state house is their perspective on things, their needs, their wants, um, their trials, and we're supposed to be solving their problems. And that's how I find that helpful because when you're in Columbus too much, the professionals will come with very sophisticated problems, very sophisticated solutions, and they may or may not be on the minds of, of the people back home. So the more time you can spend with the people back home, um, the more realistic view you're going to have uh, as you come to Columbus as to what the real problems are, what the people will accept in terms of solutions, what they're willing to do and not do, um, and your priorities will come from them rather than from you and from people, paid professionals, who are happy to provide you with a list of their top ten priorities. But wait a minute, I'm, I, I don't represent them. I represent these guys back home. So those are a couple ways. Between faith, family, friends, and community, those are the things that keep me grounded um, because there'll be people who, sh- who don't call me senator. They call me Bill, and they shake me by the shoulders and say, you guys need to be doing this, or you did a good job with that, or you dropped the ball here. Those are the kind of things we need. Not protest, mind you, but, but you know, every so often you need to be approachable. And, 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 and engage, you, the truth. You, need, you need people to, everyday people to engage you. You probably have your fill of lobbyists, but it's the, it's the constituents. And Absolutely. And, you know, You know, we don't always, you know, we try to respond to every email, every phone call. We don't always, but we're always listening to what people are saying. And and that's true when I'm out in the district, um, you know, at the Preble County Pork Festival over the weekend for two days. You know, you're talking to people, real people, real problems and real issues. People do need to be engaged. And um, I think their state legislators more approachable and more accessible than than they probably think. Um, Because we do have email, we do have phones. Um, and hopefully, if we're doing our jobs, we're out in the district, and you'll come across us from time to time. And um, and I think we're always interested in hearing uh, what's going on. Well, is people, there, for instance, I mean, you were out there among that you said at this pork fe- fe- festival, right? Mm-hmm. W- did some somebody bring up an issue that you, you know, would go, well, let me work on that when I get back to Columbus? Um, what w- there's a number of a, a couple of the big things that I'm hearing out in the district have to do with I, I probably come together in the form of. Um, uncertainty about um, the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare and what that's doing. That seems to be on a lot of people's minds because... Because it's a big hot-button issue. It's a hot-button issue. The implementation date is coming up in October 1st, and people, whether I'm a business and I don't really understand what's going to happen to me, or you're um, a person who may or may not need medical coverage, there's a lot of uncertainty there, and they don't really know how what's going to happen... And so they look to the state, they look to their counties, and, and can you help us understand what's going to happen? And sometimes we can, and then many times we can't. Um, you know, Washington functions differently, and um, 
so we don't have all the answers necessarily. That's something that um, that seemed to be on a lot of people's minds. Um, is uh, is that you know people will always tend to talk about pocketbook issues. You know, it's about you know taxes and it's about cost of living and it's about jobs and job opportunity. I chair the Senate's Workforce and Economic Development Committee meetings. Excuse me, committee. And so anything involving workforce, which is trying to make sure that our citizens, uh, whether they're students, young adults, unemployed adults, have the, the training and education they need to find the, you know, the jobs that are available today, it also is making sure that as employers, you, know, you can find the workers you need. And that's, that's workforce development, is trying to make sure that we have the workers that our employers need so that they can expand in Ohio, so that they can relocate to Ohio. Um, and, and so when people find that out, there's a lot of conversations about jobs and skill training and with a lot of business owners who can't find the people they need, which is kind of given our unemployment rate, which is getting better, but still probably higher than many of us would like. It, it's, there's a disconnect between people who can't seem to find work, and yet there's so many employers that can't find uh, the, the workers they need. And there's a lot of reasons for that. There's drug screening, um, criminal background. There's just skills are lacking. Uh, we hear a lot about soft skills, showing up to work on time, being able to work with the guy next to you with whom, you know, they like the Browns, I like the Bengals, we don't, you know, we're, we just don't get along, and, you know, just a lot of these soft skills that, that a lot of us from our generation take for granted. I mean, you know, hmm. why, I don't know why showing up to work deserves extra merit, because that's kind of what we were raised to do. If you need to be there at 8 o'clock, you're there at 8 o'clock, and you... You know, if you're required to stand on your feet, you stand on your feet, and that's, you know, but there's people who don't want to do those jobs and, um, and find them challenging. So workforce is a, is a challenging topic, and it's something we hear a lot about out in the field. So the, so all the committees that you're on, you're on the ins- insurance, you're what, you're, you're, are you a chairman of some committees? I'm the chairman of the Workforce and Economic Development Committee. So okay. anything involving workforce development or economic development would come through my committee. I sit on the Education Committee. I sit on the Insurance and Financial Institutions Committee, which gets back to my banking background. And I sit on the Ways and Means, which would be um, typically involve tax issues, anything revolving tax, tax reform, um, tax credits, those types of things go before the Ways and Means Committee typically. So those are the four committees I'm on. Uh, I also serve on a number of boards and commissions. I'm the chair of the Ohio Commission on Fatherhood, and I serve on the Third Frontier Advisory Board. is, uh, is one of the other boards that I also serve on, uh, representing the Senate on that. So that's technology, investing, entrepreneurship, uh, and things like that. So uh, it's an interesting board to be on. The, uh, but we'll, on, on, there's, a, there's a, a fatherhood board? There is an Ohio Commission on Fatherhood. And uh, it has been around, I don't know, maybe 10 years, something like that. I've been on the board, uh, the commission, I should say, uh, for the last two and a half years since I arrived in the Senate, being a former stay-at-home dad, it's kind of a natural fit that I'm going to represent the Senate on the, uh, the Ohio Commission on Fatherhood. I was recently elected the chairman of that committee. And the goal of the Commission on Fatherhood is to um, improve you know, the quality of fatherhood across the state of Ohio. And there's an official mission statement. There's a website. Uh, and how we work is we get funding from the General Assembly to the tune of about a million dollars a year. And then we administer grants to local organizations um, who typically have fatherhood type programs. So we're working hard to try and measure outcomes to improve uh, the quality of fatherhood because we know the value um, that an engaged, um, uh, mature, uh, responsible father can bring to a child's life. And so to the extent that you can reach out to people who maybe didn't have good fathers themselves or didn't have any fathers themselves, and kind of help them in their mission because you know typically you're not there unless you want to be there. So these are these are men, typically young men, first time fathers, typically but not always, who want to be better fathers and are asking, how do I do this? And they're doing that across the state of Ohio. And we've got a number of um, of typically faith based organizations who who offer services. We're now part of Jobs and Family Services. We used to be part of the Ohio. Um, uh, Office of Faith-Based Education is where we used to be. Now we're part of Jobs and Family Services. So the Ohio Commission on Fatherhood. Yep, that's correct. So if you, if you, uh, someone hearing this broadcast wants to find out about how to be a better father, they would go to a website? Yes, you could go to, and I don't have the website added, but if you were to Google um, or search Ohio Commission on Fatherhood, you're going to come up with our website. 
uh, which has links and resources available, which can probably put you in touch with maybe local organizations um, that may offer programming to help you along those lines. That is absolutely the case. Okay. Well, let me ask you another one of my questions here. Mm -hmm. um, if someone wants to follow in your footsteps, <laughs> what would you recommend? Well, besides thick skin, um, you know, my path to the Senate is unusual in that I wasn't born thinking I was going to be in the General Assembly. And I came to politics through public service. You know, when I was in banking, uh, I was raised by a father who himself was involved in his community. And so as a part of banking, of course, banks want you involved in your community. So I got involved in, in my local community. And when I became a stay-at-home father and had some more time, I became even more involved and wound up getting an appointment to the Tip City Council. I didn't become more politically involved until after I was already in elective office. Now, as an appointee, I hadn't won an election yet. That's when I got more involved in, in party politics. So for someone who wanted to follow in my footsteps, I would suggest that you get involved in your community because to, to come to the, the state house with a political philosophy and a political bent um, is fine, if not necessary. But what you need to bring are experiences outside of just the political realm, I think, would help Ohio. And so what I could bring once I was in politics, I brought my experience as a father, my experience as a banker, as a financial analyst, and as a real estate person, and all the various committees and stuff. I knew Tip City very well because I'd served on all these committees. I was on the library board, and, and anything in the General Assembly revolving libraries, people come to me because I was on the library board. So it would be to round out your political um, philosophy and your political desires to round that out with some solid experience that you can bring uh, to the table to help, whether it's, whether it's your local uh, council, whether it's your township trustees, whether it is your county commissioners or your school board, you know, something experience that you can bring, whether it's a volunteer experience, whether it's paid experience, um, to round that out and not just a political point of view. Um, but to, to sharpen that with some real experience that you can bring in successes and failures, because that's what our community boards need. You know, there's a lack of volunteers across our communities. And so if you want to get involved in politics and um, if you want to sit in the General Assembly, you may find the first step being a local, a local board right around the corner that meets on the third Thursdays at 7 o'clock, and you get involved there and learn how it is to work with people over whom you have no functional control. You know, it's one thing to be in the private sector, and I've got a boss, and I, I'm the boss of several people. You get on these boards, nobody works for anybody else. You need to get along. You need to persuade. You need to build coalitions. And those are the skills you really need in the General Assembly because none of these other senators work for me. I can't make them do anything. I need to persuade them to do things. I need to build coalitions. All these things I learned back in my own community where nobody's paying me anything. But that's how you learn some of these skills um, along with how certain meetings run and, and what it's like to make decisions in a public environment, make it less shocking, and uh, and you can become effective immediately um, if you've got the right experience. So I encourage everybody to get out and help your communities, and if you can bring that to the state house, then that'd be fabulous. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to uh, talk about that I haven't thought to ask? I would I would just ask for people's prayers. I mentioned back uh, earlier on about the value. Uh, that I find and how touched I was when people started thanking me for running, thanking me for serving, which caught me off guard when the first few people offered that. It's rare, but people offer that because I think they understand a little bit about what we go through. And then uh, and then, uh, just keep me in your prayers and uh, keep me and my family in your prayers. That is about uh, what I would ask of, of you and your audience, as I always do when I see you in the halls. So. Thank you again. This is Reverend Thomas Wise. The show is called Politically Wise. I'm interviewing, have interviewed now, uh, Bill Beagle, Senator Bill Beagle, in his office here at the Ohio State House. The show is titled Politically Wise, and I am your host, Reverend Thomas Wise. Thank you for listening today. If you want to email me, you may do so at politically.wise at gmail.com. Please like us on our Facebook page, Politically Wise. Now, here's your blessing. Blessings based on Psalms chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. May God bless you when you hear God's warning. 
May God bless you when you are wise. May God bless you when you serve the Lord with fear. May God bless you when you rejoice with trembling. May God bless you when you take refuge in the Lord.